Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's free public webinar with TPC entitled The Systematic Approach to Troubleshooting an HVAC System. We are joined here today by our instructor, William Smith, or we go by Bill Smith here uh, with friends. Uh, we're going to be talking with Bill a little bit today about uh, HVAC systems and some of the uh, best practices for troubleshooting them. Um, understanding those temperature reading, superheat, subcool a little bit we're going to talk about today. Obviously, we can only go so far into into the topic in a one hour webinar, but we hope this gives you a nice little burst of information um, on the topic that you can use to do some training after this as well. Um, to get us all started, I'm gonna just get us some housekeeping things out of the way and run a little poll for you before we hand it over to Bill. First things first, that this session is being recorded. And this recording will be made available on our website, tpctraining.com, within about two business days from the session. You'll see the specific link to the webinar recording page um, at that time. You can also actually uh, go onto our webinar recording page anytime you want. And there's a whole library of great webinars we've recorded over the last several years. In fact, uh, on HVAC, electrical, plant management, mechanical topics, all the way across, and, and as well as training best practices. So do check those out. There's a whole library here you can watch. Uh, also, you can make sure to use the Q&A button in this session. And the Q&A button is located at the bottom of your screen uh, called Q&A. And you can basically type any questions you like to our instructor. And we'll be sure to answer them at the end of the session. And then finally, this session is live. And because of that, I wanna utilize that live nature of this session by running a poll to get us started. So to learn a little bit more about who's here on the session. And so what you're gonna see is a, a poll with a couple of questions popping up on your screen right now. We got two questions and you can click your, the answer with your mouse um, on the question that applies most to you and the, and the answers to that question. The first question being, how comfortable are you with understanding the term superheat and subcooling and how to measure them on HVAC systems? Are you very comfortable with that? Are you somewhat comfortable with that? More neutral, not sure. Uh, somewhat uncomfortable or very uncomfortable with the idea of, let's say, if you're asked to do superheating sub and subcooling right now on an HVAC system. And number two, um, how many years of experience would you say you have working on HVAC systems? One year or less? between one and three years roughly, or three or more years of experience working on HVAC systems. So we're getting a good influx of the answers. And it looks like the answers are about evening out. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll right now, and then share the results with everyone on the call. So as you can imagine, which is a great thing to see, the experience level is across the board uh, from very comfortable to very uncomfortable, um, pretty much evenly matched between 15 and 25% uh, of you across the board uh, have different levels of comfort. So there's basically a wide range of experience level um, and comfort level with uh, the terminology in terms of superheat and subcooling. Um, and then secondly, uh, in terms of experience level, it looks like most of you, 45% of you have one year or less of experience working directly on HVAC systems. So this is a great webinar for you and I think you're in the right place. Uh, and then the second most, 33% of you actually have three or more years of experience. So there's a, again, wide range of experience here, um, but it's always gonna be helpful to get learning no matter what stage of your career working on air conditioning and refrigeration systems you are in. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the sharing results. It should disappear from your screen. And if it hasn't, just make sure uh, you see a full screen that says systematic approach to troubleshooting an HVAC system. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Bill Smith. Thank you so much for being here, Bill. Thank you, Ryan. Welcome everyone to uh, this continued education of TPC training on air conditioning refrigeration. So to start out, air conditioning is just a basic heat transfer. It's taking heat from one place and moving it to a place where it's not wanted or unobjectional. So it's a matter of getting heat out of your conditioned space. And with troubleshooting involved with that, we're gonna talk about a little bit about superheat subcooling and how superheat and subcooling will be able to help you diagnose your system to make sure that it is working to the optimum and able to remove the proper amount of heat from your system. We definitely don't want to have anybody that's out there. And especially in the summertime coming up, it's gonna to be too hot in the conditioned space. 
So air conditioning is going to cool people. Refrigeration cools products. To move the heat from one place to the other, we're going to have what we call heat exchangers. The key with heat exchangers is we're moving heat from one place to the other. And our basic problem with air conditioning as far as number one problem mechanical for air conditioning not working properly is fans, ductwork, and air handlers. If you don't have air movement, you're not going to have any air conditioning. And thermodynamics says that heat transfers from hot to cold. So we have to have some place where we're colder and some place where we're hotter, and we're going to give off heat and absorb heat in one area and give off the heat in another area. In an evaporator, we're going to pick up the heat from the conditioned space. In a condenser, all the heat that we picked up in conditioned space, we're going to go ahead and give it outside. So in order to accomplish that, we have to make sure we have a good temperature range of what we want to be at. We want to have it colder in our evaporator and have it warmer in our condensing unit. The amount of heat that we're moving is considered to be a British thermal unit. So when you size a unit, you're sizing it to remove a certain amount of heat from a conditioned space in an hour's time. So one BTU is about the temperature of one pound of water being raised. So take a match, hold a match underneath a pound of water, and all that heat absorbed into the water, one match, will cause a change in temperature of one degrees. For air conditioning, in a retrospect, what we're doing is we're actually removing heat from the conditioned space by taking BTUs of heat energy out. So as diagnostics, making sure you're sizing the system to the needs you have. So if you have more BTUs of heat energy needed to be removed, you're going to have a larger system. If you have a smaller amount of BTUs of heat energy removed, you're going to have a smaller system. And it's all a matter of balancing it out, making sure we have the right amount of airflow and the amount of, amount of refrigerant available to remove the heat for us. Our diagnostics tools are these right here. This is our manifold gauge set. When you go to the doctor, the doctor checks your heart. The doctor checks your lungs. He's not physically going inside to check it. He has to have some way of diagnosing from outside. And this is three different methods we're going to see for diagnostic systems, a basic uh, analog set of gauges, and then the new advanced, the digital set, which a lot of people want to jump right into digital right away. And it's always better to learn the basics on an analog and then jump into the, to the, uh, to the digital. And here's what we're talking about. Pressure-temperature relationship. If I take those gauges and I hook them up to my refrigeration system, we're going to have what we call established high side and established low side of our system. What we're going to do is we're going to look, and for example, today we're going to be talking about R410A, common refrigerant you're going to see in air conditioning systems. And your low side pressure is generally going to run right around 120 PSIG. Now at 120 PSIG on that gauge, what that tells us is that at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, our evaporator is that temperature and is absorbing heat into the refrigerant for us and taking the heat and absorbing it in so we can discharge it in the condenser outside somewhere else. And generally for our 410, we're going to run around 400 degrees, 400 PSIG, which is going to convert to about 115. So each pressure on this chart converts to a certain temperature at which the refrigerant is changing state. So at 40 degrees, if I take 70 degree air and blow it across there, the air is going to be cool because I'm pulling heat out of the air. And all the heat that I put in the refrigerant is going to be displaced outside by the condensing unit at 400 PSIG at approximately 115 degrees temperature. Now, of course, that temperature that it's condensing at will be different according to your environment. I just spoke to a guy yesterday that was from Arizona. Temperature there is 105 degrees. So we're going to need a little bit more heat, higher heat content on the outdoor unit. So we're going to be pushing maybe 120, 130 on the outdoor unit. That'll vary according to your environment. But for average for United States, 120 and 400, which will put you at a 40 degree temperature for your evaporator and 115 for your condenser. That's pretty good average. Temperature. Now also we're looking at is blended refrigerants. The R410A is an example of a blended refrigerant. A blended refrigerant is a refrigerant that we have mixed together two different chemicals to combine into one. The problem with blended refrigerants is that we have what we call temperature glide and we also have fractionation. Fractionation is the first one we're going to talk about. When you're troubleshooting a system, if there's a leak with a blended refrigerant, you're going to leak out percentage of the refrigerant and you're not going to have the 100% blend you're looking for. So 
what you notice is that your superheating subcooling is going to be way off. You check the system, you probably you find a leak and you want to fix the leak. The best option to do is instead of us adding refrigerant to try to get it back up to the level where you want it to be, the best option is to take all that refrigerant out and weigh in the proper charge in a blended or a liquid method. So the liquid method is going to not affect by the compression separation, component separation, and we're not going to have a difference in uh, temperature. We're going to have the same chemical bonded together. So when you put oil and water, no matter how bad you shake it up, they're going to separate away from each other. So that's what we're doing with this refrigerant. In a vapor state, we're causing this refrigerant to separate away from each other. So you're going to have one heavier than the other. So what's going to happen is if you have chemical A, chemical B, chemical A will sit on top of chemical B, and all of A is going to leak out before any of B leaks out. And you want a good 50-50 mix there. So if you go out in an R410A system, it's very common when R410A first came out, a lot of people didn't know they had to charge it as a liquid. They were charging it as a vapor, and then it wasn't acting the way it was supposed to. It wasn't mixing, making the compound like we wanted. So it's very important to make sure we, we put it in there as a liquid. Now, temperature glide is a little different. Temperature glide, when we start talking about superheat and subcooling, superheat is the difference between the temperature at which we're saturated in the evaporator, changing our liquid refrigerant to a vapor, and how much extra heat are we adding to that vapor? And bubble point is that out retrospect, we're going from cooling it, cooling that vapor down and forming it back into a liquid. And the difference between the temperature at which it's changing from a vapor to a liquid to it's 100% liquid is the bubble point. So temperature glide is the difference between the dew point and the bubble point. So starting out with refrigeration back in the 80s when I started out, there was no such thing as temperature glide. So it didn't matter if I looked on that PT chart we had a little bit ago there that I was on the evaporator or the condenser, but the new PT charts are gonna have dew point, bubble point, or sometimes it might say vapor, or sometimes it might say liquid. And it's very important to make sure you're using the right side of that as you go down through. So 410A would have a vapor and a liquid or dew point and bubble point and make sure you're corresponding the right one to each one as you're going down through. So a little more technology involved, a little more. So major differences, you're gonna make it always charge as a liquid. And if you have a leak, you're gonna to wanna to take all the refrigerant out where in the old days we used to be able to just top it off. We can't do that anymore. So as far as refrigeration goes, what we're looking at is this. We're taking a saturated liquid and we hit this first line right here and we're starting to change the state. We're gonna have this cool enough that when warm air hits this, it's gonna cause this refrigerant to bubble off from a liquid to a vapor. So inside these two lines right here, we're gonna have a liquid and a vapor mixture together. And we're gonna use a pressure gauge and a pressure temperature chart we saw just a little bit ago. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna see that at 120 pounds pressure, it's changing state at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And then once we go ahead and put a temperature probe on the outlet of our evaporator, we're gonna compare the two. And how much extra heat we add into that is gonna be called our superheat. Now, why is superheat so important? Superheat is important because on the other side of the, we've got a compressor over here. And the one thing you cannot compress is liquid. If you try and take liquid and make it into a smaller container, you're going to break your hands, you're going to break your, or break your cylinder. You're not going to be able to compress it properly. So we want just vapor going back into our compressor, but the vapor we're sending back has to be cool enough to keep the compressor cool. It's our method of cooling the compressor. We're using what we call a hermetic compressor. Everything's sealed up and our windings and everything is inside of there. So you guys have an engine in your car, you have a radiator and you have a fan in there that's blowing air across there, keeping your engine cool. The compressor doesn't have that. So it's relying on getting refrigerant vapor back at a proper temperature to maintain the components of the compressor working properly. Now, for the condenser, it's a little different. For the condenser now, we're going ahead, we're taking all the heat we picked up in a vapor state, and we're getting to a point in between these lines here again, where we're changing it from a vapor back into a liquid. And that's our saturation temperature. So cool ambient air, cool, could be 95 degrees. As long as it's colder than the refrigerant, the refrigerant is going to want to give off its heat to this. So as I was saying, as far as 
um, location. If you are in Arizona, you might want, you're going to have to run your condenser temperature a little higher than what you would in Pennsylvania. Right now it's only 80 degrees out. So if we get to 95 saturation temperature, that's cool enough that it's going to pull heat out of the refrigerant and cause the refrigerant to change back into a liquid. So for superheat, for subcooling, pardon me, we're checking the difference between what we got as a vapor and liquid mixture compared to what we get when we're 100% liquid on the other side. So we're measuring the liquid level inside the condenser for subcooling. And as we saw here for superheat, we're measuring the saturation temperature, comparing what we have for going from a liquid to a vapor to 100% vapor. It's very important that both of those are dialed in to the exact point we want them to be. So a little more detail on how we find superheat. What we're doing again is we're taking a blue gauge, the color blue representing the low side of our system, and we're getting a pressure. And in this instance, we're saying we have 50 PSIG for our 134A refrigerant, and that converts to a saturation temperature of 54 degrees. So inside of here, as soon as that temperature reaches 54 degrees, we're no longer changing the temperature of the refrigerant. We're strictly changing the refrigerant and boiling it off from a liquid to a vapor. We want to know where this point of last liquid is. We want to have as much liquid in the evaporator as possible without pushing liquid out to the compressor. And we want to make sure that we have a good temperature going back to the compressor. So superheat, that's where superheat is measured. It's measured on the outlet of the outlet of the evaporator before it gets into the compressor. And we want a nice constant temperature going into that uh, compressor. Subcooling. We're taking that all the heat that we picked up in the evaporator and we're sending it into the condenser. And when we get down to a, con a condensing temperature where we're latent heat, we're changing it from a vapor back into a liquid. So at 150 PSIG using our PT chart for R134A, it gives a saturation temperature 112 degrees. So at 112 degrees, we're changing the refrigerant from one state to another. And then once we get to the outlet of the condenser, now we're 100% liquid. There's a metering device that's on the other side of this condenser. That metering device job is to take that high pressure, high temperature liquid and lower it down to a low pressure, low temperature liquid to feed back into, into the evaporator. We want 100% liquid going to that metering device. It doesn't like to have a mixture. It wants 100% feeding in there. So we got to make sure that this range here is proper. Usually 8 to 12 drop is what we're looking for. Once we get to 8 to 12 drop, we know that the point where we're changing over to a liquid is at the right spot we want it to be. We don't want too much liquid, but we want just the right amount. And that's one way of checking to see where our level is in our evaporator or condenser, again, is our superheat and our subcooling. The newest of expansion valves, the main, main one you're going to see out there, just kind of give you a little understanding of how it works, is called the metering device. The re reason it's metering is because it's controlling the flow of refrigerant liquid going into my evaporator. The superheat bulb is mounted on the outlet. Remember, that's where we're going to find our superheat in the outlet evaporator. And that bulb wants to be at a certain temperature. It's constant. It's like, hey, 65 degrees temperature is perfect for me. 70 degrees temperature is perfect for me. And it's set. It's, and so what's happening is as this bulb gets hot, we're allowing more liquid to push into our evaporator to go ahead and keep this superheat in the range we want it to be. And as the bulb gets cold, we're going to push back and close down the flow of refrigerant and constantly monitor a, a superheat in the system. So this particular metering device controls the superheat for us. We don't have any control over superheat. It does it for us. The only thing that we can make is a superheat spring right here, adjusting how much superheat we have. And this, again, this is what it looks like. So on a perfect day, we have a conference room. We, we, the conference room can fit 30 people. Somebody has sized it out for a certain amount of BTs of heat energy to be removed from the conference room in a certain amount, in an hour's time. And we've got the right amount of liquid going in here, saturated at 54 degrees. And as we're picking up heat, 
we're picking up just the right amount of heat to keep this bulb to where it's comfortable. In the event that we pack that conference room, then our point of last liquid is going to fall down here. Now, two things are going to happen. One, we're going to have too much vapor going back to our bulb. And with too much vapor, too much added heat from the conditioned space, and it's going to cause the temperature of that bulb to rise up. It's not going to like it. So what's going to happen is that bulb gets hot. It's going to push down against, and it's going to cause the bulb pressure to win the battle and allow the refrigerant to push back up to this point right here. And notice our superheat now started out at 10 and has gone to 5 because we're pushing too much liquid up through here now and allowing this to get too cold. And if that gets too cold, it's going to say, whoa, let's back up here a second. Let's go ahead and let's stop the flow of refrigerant and try to keep this point of last liquid at a constant point of right here. That's where we want to be at. So what this is doing is controlling the amount of superheat in our system by going ahead and allowing more or less refrigerant to push through. Because this is controlling the superheat. The other way of checking the system then would be if you have this type of expansion device, you're going to use subcooling to do that. And that'll be found in a condenser. Now, for troubleshooting, if you're not sure if this bulb is working properly or not, the best option is to take it off and hold it in your hand and heat it up. And you should see the pressure start to change immediately. As soon as that bulb gets hot, it should change the pressure because it's going to push more liquid into this into this evaporator. If it doesn't, then that tells you the bulb is bad and you're going to have to replace that bulb. So one way of troubleshooting a TXV is to go ahead and remove that bulb and let it go ahead and get hot and see if the liquid starts to push more into the, into the system. Very important for troubleshooting to make sure that that system, that that is insulated properly and secured properly on the line itself. Now, for electrical problems, this is a basic schematic of what an electrical system would look like. If you're going to be an HVAC mechanic, you better understand how to do electrical. We offer a lot of classes in our, our, our courses, and Ryan can go over them with you as far as electrical troubleshooting. This particular one would be if you wanted to read a schematic and find out, okay, I'm not getting electricity to my compressor. I'm not getting electricity to my condenser fan motor. What do I have to do to fix that problem? So there's some electrical troubleshooting, a little bit, a touching base a little bit there. Now, getting back to our superheat and subcooling, the main topic of today's discussion. What we're taking is warm air across here. And as we see the dark blue here, that's our liquid. And we're changing from the liquid to a vapor. And the superheat is the amount of heat that's added to that vapor by the time it gets up to this compressor. We want to make sure that that temperature is a good temperature range. We want to make sure that we're not getting liquid back. If we get liquid back, that temperature is going to fall way down. So instead of reading 50 here, it might read 45. And that means that we're not having enough vapor to pick up heat and liquid is possibly getting back to the compressor. And if we go the other direction and this shoots up to 60, 65, and we want it to be 50, that means that there's not enough um, not enough liquid here and that's causing the temperature to rise up. So if your superheat is too high, 60, 65, you want to add refrigerant to lower it. And if your refrigerant temperature is too low, that or vapor temperature too low, we want to remove refrigerant to try to raise it back up again. Now for the TXV, because that valve controls the superheat for me, I need to have a way of checking to see where the system is charged properly. And that's our sub cooling. So again, the subcooling now is taking that vapors coming in here and cooling it down, causing it to change to 100% liquid. When it changed 100% liquid, the difference in temperature between what it's saturated at and what it is at as a 100% liquid is the amount of subcooling. And I want to make sure that I've got 100% liquid meeting that metering device. I don't want to have a mixture. And it needs to be down to a certain temperature in order for it to work properly. On your unit, you're going to have a data plate. And that data plate is going to say, we need this amount of subcooling for this unit. And that manufacturer is taking the time to sit down and figure it out what they want it to be. And that's what we're looking, striving for. So here is our system. I'm taking a low pressure gauge and I'm putting it on. I'm reading 120 PSIG. Converting that to a saturation temperature of 40. And if you see the purple line I drew here, 
from there to here, I'm gaining an extra 15 degrees of heat. And we're going to call that our superheat. We want to make sure that we're gaining the right amount of heat without getting too much heat added to our vapor. And on the other side, again, we're coming out high side gauge can either go on the outlet of the compressor or the outlet of the condenser. And we have a saturation temperature. So we're changing from a vapor to a liquid at 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And as we continue, once we reach the 100% liquid point, until we get to this temperature probe right here, we're losing 10 degrees of heat, 10 degrees of heat. So it's telling us that that is the amount of subcooling and the amount of superheat. For this particular setup, we have 15 degrees of superheat added to our vapor, and we have 10 degrees of subcooling removed from our liquid. So how can we use the superheat and subcooling to check our system? Well, this would be our normal operating day. We call this our normal operating pressures or our baseline. This is what's normal. So if I take a chart like this, a diagnostics chart and say, huh, if I have a restricted evaporator coil, that 120 pressure on my suction on my low side is gonna be lower than normal. The head pressure, the condenser pressure is gonna be lower than normal. And my superheat is going to be lower than normal. If I'm looking for 15 degrees of superheat, then I'm going to have less superheat than what I normally would see and less subcooling than what I normally would see. So I'm going to have to clean the evaporator coil. Restrict the evaporator coil. It could be a simple fact that the, the coil is dirty. It could be the filter is dirty. It could be the fan has stopped working. Air flow. And in retrospect, the other direction, if you have higher pressure, norm, higher than 120, higher than 400, your superheat is still low, but your subcoolant, then your higher pressures will lead you to, to re restrict a condenser coil. Here's one that I find a lot of times for troubleshooting that I, when I'm training, I find guys get caught up in this. They automatically see that they see low suction pressure, they see low condenser pressure, and they just automatically assume that the system's undercharged. But the symptoms for undercharge would say that the superheat is high and the subcooling is low. And if they don't check that chart, they're just going to automatically assume that the system is undercharged. They're going to start adding refrigerant into the system, and the superheat, which is already low, is going to continue to go down, and we're going to start flooding liquid back on my compressor. And that's definitely not what we want. We don't want liquid getting back to my compressor. So using this chart right here, once you know your normal operating pressures, your normal operating superheat, your normal operating subcooling, you can use a chart like this to go ahead and diagnose the system to find out what's wrong and what possibly could lead you. Is it undercharged, overcharged, restricted evaporator, and restricted condenser coil? Ryan put together a very good 3D demonstration for this when we do our air conditioning class that we teach on Mondays and Tuesdays on virtual reality. I bring it up and we can we uh, demonstrate how to put gauges on and show you how your symptoms are going to be if you have a restricted condenser coil, restricted evaporator coil, if it's undercharged or overcharged. Now, if you're doing a specific TXV setup, again, high operating superheat, low operating superheat, Maybe you're, you have too much airflow, too much heat load, refrigerant charge is low. So there's a lot of different symptoms that are going to come and go with a um, troubleshooting a TXV. One of the main things you want to do, if you're not sure if your TXV is working properly, is take that thing off, dunk in hot water, hold your hand on it, and you should watch the pressure start to change on your low side of your system. Preventive maintenance goes a long way for troubleshooting, making sure your condenser coil is clean. If you have a dirty condenser coil, making sure you're spraying your water opposite of the, of the dirt coming in, because otherwise you're gonna pack the dirt back into the condenser. If you ever walk up on a straight AC system and you see an evaporator frozen coil like this right here, that means that generally you have some type of restriction of flow air flow going into your evaporator. You lost the, you lost, a dirty filter, you lost the fan, something's not blowing air across this coil and not causing refrigerant to change from a liquid to a vapor. And you've got liquid coming back out of the evaporator. And that's where you're going to see that frost build up like that. Making sure you're cleaning your condenser coils and also fin straightening. 
So what we got is we got tubes going across here and we got fins. So we make sure the fins are at the right distance apart to allow air to push through there. If they get smashed together, you can use a straightening comb to go ahead and straighten it. But recommendation, wear gloves because otherwise these are razor blades and they will cut your fingers. Again, can't say enough about making sure that your filters are clean. Changing the filters, schedule PM, visual inspection. So I can hold the filter up and look. If I see light through, that means that the filter is clean. If I don't see light, if light can't get through, air is not going to get through. And pressure drop, magnahela or manometer. They're both kind of the same terminology. What we're looking at is going ahead and checking the pressure difference between one side of the filter and the other side of the filter. I'm going to put a brand new filter in there and I'm going to measure how much drop in pressure I have across there. And as the pressure increases, that means that the dirt is getting blocked up in the filter and I've got too much dirt built up in there and I need to go ahead and figure out is, you know, and pull the filter out and change that filter. The problem is for some of the units though, if it's a critical environment that that HVAC equipment has to run to, in order for someone, for, especially for ventilation systems, you can't just pull the filter out and check to see if the filter is dirty. So using your gauge, your magnahela, check your inch of water column, drop across there, difference in pressure, too much difference in pressure, filter is dirty, we need to go ahead and change it. So wrapping this thing up, what we're looking at is always remember the following steps. Number one, check for dirty air filter. I don't know how many times I get calls from people that, hey, our unit's frozen up. I said, oh, when's the last time you change your air filter? And especially if you have dogs or cats, we all know we have dogs and cats out there. The air is going to clog in there all the time. Check your thermostat settings. Um, unfortunately, older people, including myself, sometimes forget. If you see your thermostat setting says um, off or on, on for a thermostat doesn't always mean that the unit's running. It could be just a circulating air and it's not set to a lower temperature to go ahead and circulate and cool or temper the air through the system. Check your air conditioning circuit breakers, check your outdoor unit. Outdoor unit, making sure that you have proper airflow going across there. Check your air vents. If you close off too many air vents, they set that system up, designed it for a certain amount of airflow going through your system. And if you don't have enough air moving, you're not gonna have any type of cooling going on properly. Then, after you check these simple things, then if you have a certification, remember EPA 608 says you have to have a certification to hook up gauges, hook up your manifold gauges, check for proper superheat and subcooling, use the diagnostics to find the right solution. And always don't assume that the refrigerant problem, know your tools and use them. So just because you think it's low on charge, it could actually be the fact that you have a dirty air filter and it'll make it look like it's low on charge. So Ryan, I thank you for the time to present this today. And I hope uh, you have some good questions to wrap this up. So Ryan, go ahead and you can have it, bud. Absolutely, thanks so much, Bill. Um, so for those of you listening in, this is kind of phase one and then phase two of this webinar. So just like we talked about at the beginning, Bill went through a lot of content, right? Ooh, I'm, I'm feeling some whiplash right there. So, so much to learn, right? So much to learn. Uh, air conditioning. Now is kind of phase two of that webinar. For all of you who are here and tuning in live, feel free to start asking some questions on the Q&A line. Um, and we can we can really start answering your question and we'll be happy to answer them for the remainder of the time we have together. So um, first question I, I'd like to pose to you, Bill, is that you mentioned uh, a normally operating or a a normal operation superheat and a normal operation subcool. Um, how do we know what normal operation superheat and subcool is supposed to be? Sure, Ryan. For air conditioning systems, your generally normal operating for your superheat is going to be about 10 degrees difference between your saturation temperature and your temperature at your bulb. The manufacturer will set that up. They got it set. They don't want you to touch it and adjust it. For your subcooling, your generally range is going to be 8 to 12, but on your data plate itself, there'll be a stamp on there from the manufacturer that says, we would like to see this amount of subcooling. So if the manufacturer calls for six and, well, Mr. Smith said 8 to 12, 
go with what the manufacturer calls for because they are the ones that have set that up for you. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, we got a question that came in the Q&A line, Bill. Um, uh, are you ever in danger of slugging the compressor uh, by removing the TXV bulb from the suction line? And by the way, um, if you don't mind, Bill, explaining what slugging might mean as well. Sure. Slugging is uh, getting liquid back on the compressor. So you're going to go ahead and have a, a per liquid pushing through. Now the question, yes, you're going to get some slugging if you you know heat it up too fast. But if you do it for just a short amount of time, you should see a pressure difference right away in your gauge. It'll register and say, hey, whoa, it's getting too hot. And as it pushes liquid in there, you should see a drop in pressure going across your gauge. If you continue to do it for too long, yes, it could slug your compressor. So as an example, if the manufacturer, whoever installed the unit, didn't insulate the bulb properly, it can be affected by ambient air temperature. And that'll cause some slugging back on the compressor. Okay. And um, is, are there issues around, uh, and maybe you could explain a little bit about if we had an oversized condenser um, and what that could possibly mean if it was too large? Oversized condenser that uh, used to be that they had a condenser that when it was a one ton system, it was one size and a two ton was another size. Actually oversized condensers nowadays for high efficiency. The more heat you can get out, and sometimes they oversize condensers because you're gonna have low ambient conditions, you're gonna have liquid that's gonna be too much liquid in your system. So we're gonna use the condenser to go ahead and allow it to hold extra liquid in your system for you. It's called flooding, flooding the condenser. So it's not uncommon to see a condenser oversized but when you're sizing the system, again, you're gonna check your BTU rating for your indoor section and say, okay, I've got this amount of BTUs of heat energy I need to remove in an hour's time. So you try to match your condenser up at the same. You don't wanna go a one ton evaporator and a two ton condenser. So they're gonna to have to match up pretty close to the same. See. Um. We got an attendee with a question about the issue of ice. If we see ice um, on a discharge line, is that a restriction of a TXV valve? And I'm wondering if there is a possibility of finding ice on a discharge line. <laughs> ice on a discharge line, I'm, I'm, you got a lot of liquid going to your compressor then, if that's the case. Because yeah, because normally the, the side coming in on the suction line would be, be the, the suction line might be iced up and the suction line iced up. Yes, that would be from the compressor, you know, getting too much liquid back and not having any liquid going out or liquid going out of the compressor. But if you, I've never, I've personally never seen a discharge line that was iced up before line. Gotcha. You're just confused on the liquid and the suction, or the suction line and the discharge line. Possibly. Okay, so so if there was ice on, let's say, the suction line or or the line coming out of that evaporator, the evaporator, that would be there's a bunch of liquid on there. Then, yeah, there's liquid mm -hmm. getting into the compressor. Yeah. Got you. Okay, great. Um, speaking of the condenser, I think we're getting some good good uh, questions on. Um, the condenser side of things. Uh, what is the best way to clean a condenser? Water. Making sure you do a proper lock and tag out and water is the best cleaner. Water will clean a lot of your dirt off. And again, making sure you're locking, making electrically safe because I've seen guys in class where they show me their fingers and they have three, three fingers missing because the condenser fan motor kicked on and tip their fingers off. Um, very careful when you're doing it and water and the cleaner you use needs to be the right cleaner for the job. There's aluminum coils, there's, co there's copper coils. If you use the wrong cleaner on the condenser, you can actually cause more damage. You're gonna avoid the warranty of the condenser itself. Um, speaking of these oversized condensers there, Bill, um, why would you say one is not ideal or, or even bad? For oversizing? The for oversized, yeah. You're going to give too much heat out of the system and you're going to have too much liquid in your system. So the system is designed, manufacturers sit down and design these for a certain size. They want everything to meet the right size. They don't want, 
Now, it gets, again, gets confusing. People hear the word oversized condenser. That doesn't mean the tonnage size is different. That just means the coil surface area is larger. So that way it could be more efficient. That's when they get into high efficiency condensers. So it's a matter of what they're talking about. Condenser, as far as size of condenser, or are they talking about the tonnage size of condenser? Gotcha. Um, coming here, a uh, question coming in about uh, what would be a common sign that that a compressor is not working, right? I feel like that would be pretty fundamental to to anything working, it sounds like, but but what are pressure some telltale tell signs? Pressure difference. Mm, Once okay. you hook up your gauges and you do not have established high and low side, one of the first things you wanna check is your compressor. And you'll hear the compressor running. Another thing common in, in, is on your manifold gauges themselves, you have a set of valves on there. People think you have to exercise those valves right away to get pressure to push to the gate. You do not have to do that. And if you leave those valves open, it's actually going to equalize the high and the low side pressure. You'll think the compressor is not running and it actually is mixing in your manifold gauge. So you're not establishing the difference between the two. I see. Well, um, I'll give a, just a few more moments for you all to answer any questions. I think we made our way through all the ones that came in, Bill, but I'll, I'll give you all a chance to, to ask any more. Um, in the meantime, as, as some questions are coming in, uh, definitely what, what Bill was mentioning about training. Uh, this is just one hour. There's, there's over 16 hours, actually. If you count our more advanced air conditioning uh, troubleshooting class, we got four full, full days of class that you can really take over the course of your career maybe the next year or so, let's say, uh, different times, whatever times work for you. There's a uh, basic electric or uh, refrigeration class, and then there's a more advanced uh, refrigeration class where we bring a, a tabletop air conditioning unit uh, to the classroom, and we can all play around with a real air conditioner and see if we can uh, troubleshoot issues on it. It's a really fun class. I've been there, and Bill was teaching it, and it's really a really a great time to, to get some of that hands-on training. However, if, if you decide to take a, you know, air conditioning training uh, class online uh, on virtual over Zoom, just like Bill said, we have developed ways to be hands-on even in that environment where there's some virtual skills modules where you can be practicing putting on gauges on a virtual air conditioner and, and try your hand at a few things with the refrigeration cycle in that class. So definitely be aware that there's a way to have interactive hands-on experiences no matter which way you decide to continue training uh, moving forward. So it looks like a, a couple people took up, took me up on my offer to ask just a couple more questions there, Bill. And um, I think we should have some time to answer them. So that's not a problem. Uh, first one being, um, can you one more time review for the folks here who are maybe a little bit newer to the idea of superheating and subcooling? Um, can, can you go over what that, how we, how we actually measure for that um, when we're sitting in front of that air conditioner um, how do we determine what that is with our gauges that are available to us? Sure, Ryan. I apologize. I, I did see a chat with us. I do tend to talk fast. That's a Pennsylvania thing, so I apologize. <laughs> no worries. Taking your low side gauge and hooking it up onto your evaporator low side of your system, converting that to a temperature. So that'll be your saturation temperature. The difference between how much you're ch adding heat for a change of state. So 40 degrees Fahrenheit at 120 PSIG. So if you look at a PT chart, that'll tell you that if you have R410, that's 120 PSIG red on your gauge, that you're actually saturated and changing from one to the other from a liquid to a vapor at 40 degrees. Once I've changed to 100% vapor, all the extra heat that I add in is my superheat. So we find superheat on the outlet of the evaporator. Now, because our TXV valve controls the amount of superheat by opening and closing the valve to allow more or less liquid to come in and strive to maintain this constant temperature here, we need to use subcooling. Now subcooling then is a measurement of the high side gauge, taking this pressure, converting it to a saturation temperature, in this case R410, at 400, the 115 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's where changing from a vapor to a liquid. Everything inside of this port right here is gonna be a mixture of vapor and liquid. Once we reach the liquid point, 100% liquid, how much extra heat are we getting out of the liquid, 
would be the difference between what we see here and what we see on a temperature probe right here on the outlet of the condenser. And because it's 115 versus 105, that'll be 10 degrees of subcooling. Now, again, the superheat generally is going to be set. You can adjust it. But the subcooling, on the other hand, is based off of manufacturer's recommendation. So you go to the chart, look on the data plate on the system, and then you go ahead and it'll tell you on there, this is the required amount of subcooling for this particular system. Gotcha. But thanks for, for going, going over that. This is, yeah, I mean, as you all can imagine, it takes, it takes lots of practice, 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 practice to, to really just nail down the process of getting superheat, what it means to, for your system. Um, so we highly recommend you get practice and we can help you with that practice um, in the classroom as well. So, um, Ryan, uh, the hands on yeah. class is the way to go. If you have, if the guys have the experience and they've never done it with hands on, the hands on class is definitely the way to go. You've been there, Ryan. You've seen it. Yeah. So I can show them on a screen how to do it. But it's another thing if they can actually hook up the gauges and physically see what it looks like on a training unit on the table. So that, that, that's the experience that I think they get a lot out of that. Absolutely. It, and, and it's a fairly uh, new class for us. In the last two years, we developed this, this new hands-on um, air conditioning, advanced air conditioning class. So um, highly recommend there's, there's one coming around near you or we can come to you with this training. So it's, it'll be a fun time for you all to join in. Uh, here's a great point. I think we have two or three more questions, time permitting. Um, is head pressure control uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what that might mean? Someone's curious about what that means and if it's helpful. Sure. Head pressure control is right here, for example. I want to average out at 115 degrees temperature in my condenser. I want to maintain that constant temperature. But if it's a cooler day outside, then I'm going to give off too much heat and that temperature is going to go way down, maybe 90 or 80 degrees. And I'm not going to have the proper exchange that I'm looking for. So we're going to slow down the amount of air going across the condenser to try to raise the and keep what we call a normal operating head pressure. So that's what they mean by that, Ryan. We just want to maintain a constant pressure temperature relationship in that condenser. Awesome. Um, another curiosity is when looking at that nameplate or that manual for the uh, air conditioner, we see a SEER rating, S-E-E-R. Um, want to tell us a little bit more about what that means and how it factors into the performance of an air conditioner? SEER rating was developed in the 2000s when new air conditioning refrigerant was coming out that's better for the atmosphere. So we don't want to leak out the refrigerant atmosphere and we want to get more bang for our buck. So the SEER rating is developing a unit that will run more electrically efficient. So if you start out with a, with a 12 SEER unit, and you go up to a 20 SEER unit, your 20 SEER unit is going to be your bigger condenser. Uh, the tonnage is going to be the same, still be a two ton unit, but more surface area so you can get more heat exchange at less electrical energy consumption. That's what SEER energy, seasonal energy efficiency ratio. So it's measuring the amount of electrical consumption that the unit's going to use. And a higher SEER rating is going to give you more efficiency. So as I teach a class, I'll tell the guys, would you like to have your electric bill run you 150 bucks a month? Or would you rather have your electric bill run you 100 bucks a month? Over the years, that extra 50 bucks you're saving, the unit pays for itself. Definitely. Yeah, and that payback really is might be worth the little bit of extra upfront uh, if you're going to save more than that in, throughout the operation of this thing, it sounds like. Um, one of the last kind of technical questions and then one more that just popped in and that is um, mini split systems. I um, want to briefly explain what these individuals are talking about. There's a few talking about that on the chat line. Uh, what a mini split system is all about. And then for those mini splits, should the drain lines for those be hooked up to their water pump? Or, um, let's see, the water pump to the drain outside or not? Well, however you want to split is a window air conditioner that instead of having no window air conditioner you don't have any ductwork you just put it in your window right mm -hmm. and you have air blowing around without any ductwork well mini split what we're doing instead of having a unit in your window 
we have a separate indoor, just a blower hanging on the wall and a separate outdoor unit outside. So ductless is another way of saying it. There's no duct work involved with it at all. Now, as far as the drain goes, yeah, it's, it's always has a pump in there. So depending how far it goes through the wall before it goes outside, there's a pump in there that'll collect the water and then pump the water out to the outside. When we're doing refrigeration, air conditioning especially, we're removing moisture from the air. So all that moisture we collect in the air has to be pumped outside, somewhere outside. Um, so generally what you're gonna do is you're gonna go ahead and have a pumping mechanism, a float device inside the mini split, and it's gonna pump the water outside. So you're gonna run it line out to the outside. It'll just drain right to the outside. Gotcha. And last but not least, um, I think you and I can both speak to this one here, Bill, and that is really great question is, which certifications do we need to work in the HVAC industry? Um, is there any certifications you absolutely need or, and maybe others that we'd recommend? So um, first and foremost, that comes to my mind, Bill, is that EPA 608 you mentioned earlier. Um, that's definitely one of the requirements, kind of the legal requirements to handling refrigerant. Is that right? Yes, in order to hook up gauges and move any refrigerant in and out of the system, you have to have a 608 certification. The one nice thing about our refrigeration classes, Eric, the one I'll be teaching on Monday and Tuesday online, is you get the opportunity to get the EPA certification as part of our cost for the class. So I get a lot of people running it. That, that's a good selling point for us is that because we do offer and proctor the EPA test at the same time. There's four sections to this, to this EPA test. The core sections are general knowledge questions, and then they're broken down into your sections as to what you might work on. If you're working on small appliances, less than five pounds, you're gonna have type one. If you're working on larger systems, more than five pounds of total system refrigerant charge, you're gonna have a type two. And if you're working with chillers that work under low atmospheric pressure, less than atmospheric pressure, type three. So we offer that test in a part of our presentation. And that's about, your, other than your general knowledge, the main thing you're gonna need is to carry that certificate with you. Because once you hook up a set of gauges, you have to know how to remove the refrigerant properly without venting it to the atmosphere. Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, thank you all very much for being here. Um, this has been wonderful spending time with you all on your curiosities, questions. Um, if you have any more questions about certifications required for HVAC or um, curiosity about just what you need to do next in terms of training for HVAC, understanding how our air conditioning systems are gonna work, um, definitely reach out to us at that phone number, 808-4000. Uh, 808 um, that's really the way to get a hold of us. So you can also um, email that sales at TPC training email address and we can answer any questions you have there. Um, so certificate, right? So this is a public webinar session provided for free to the public. So unfortunately, no, no certificate for this training. But if you do want an official documented training with a completion certificate of your attendance, definitely do attend one of our classes to follow up this class. Thank you so much. Uh, you'll see this recording within two business days of today's event. Thank you so much to Bill for being here. And thank you all for being here as well. Have a wonderful day.